Today, my special guest is Mark Penn, and we're going to be discussing his eye-opening new book, Microtrends Squared, The New Small Forces Driving the Big Disruptions Today. Mark, thanks for joining us on today's show. Thank you. Now, Mark, I know you're going to be new to many of my listeners. I actually encountered your book in Barnes & Noble a couple of weeks ago, so I was like, oh, who is this guy? I need to get to know him. I know many of my listeners are going to be similar, so I would love for you to start us out by sharing what you might call a bit of the Mark Penn origin story. What are a few of the things we need to know about you? Well, let's see. I, I grew up in the Bronx. Uh, uh, my, my dad, unfortunately, passed away uh, when I was 10, so mostly it was, it was me and my mom. And uh, she believed in education, 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 and, uh, and, and I think that helped me and my brothers get a really excellent education. And I, I wound up starting out, I was going to be a lawyer, but then I switched to, uh, to polling polling for candidates and then polling for corporations and kind of grew my company and then became head of a PR firm, Burson Marsteller, and then chief strategy officer and head of advertising at Microsoft. And obviously in the interim, I, I did work on, you know, both Bill Clinton's uh, 96 presidential campaign and worked with Hillary through 2008 and got to work with Prime Minister Blair. So I've had a, a really, uh, you know, from when I grew up, very simple uh Origins. Uh, my dad had not did not go to college. Uh, uh, would, would to to really, I think, get to enjoy helping in some of the highest levels of business and politics. Wow, that's a that's a very diverse resume. Thank you for sharing that. I'd be curious to hear a little bit about when did you first discover you had a knack or interest in trends and polling? Is that something you saw early on, or was that something you encountered when you made that switch in college? Well, uh, actually, it was always kind of my hobby. I, I watched a TV show on, uh, it was actually on race relations in America, and they had a poll, and I said, oh, that's really interesting. You could, you could find out what people are thinking by doing these questionnaires. And so I did it. At, at, I copied the, the poll and replicated it in my school. I was maybe 14 or 15. Or, and uh, I had my first poll. My teacher sent it to me, and then I... I I mimi, you know, I put then we mimeograph things, you know, uh, the results, and from that I was just hooked. This is incredible, and then and then I, I, I did it at college. I, you know, whenever the administration like they had a whole housing system and they wouldn't tell people what was popular, so I went to the dining rooms and did polls, and and uh, and finally uh, you know, people knew that I was like a poll junkie, and uh, a, a fellow Doug Schoen approached me and said, "I've got a summer job in in politics. Could you?" Could you maybe show us how to do polls? And that's how we, off to the races we were. Awesome. Well, I love that this is a talent, kind of a drive that's been in you from an early age. That's really wonderful. Now, for the benefit of the listener, say, you know, again, who's encountering you for the first time in our conversation today, explain what you mean when you use that word microtrend. What's the specifics around that? Well, you know, it, it's very hard to figure out what's going on in our society because it, it, it seems to be pulled in so many different directions. And I think the big reason is that under the surface, there are lots of trends and counter trends, in fact, pulling us in, in different directions. And think of an impressionist painting and, and it's made up of dots. Well, the micro trends are the dots, usually small, developing trends, maybe 1% or 2% of the of the population, and yet, you know, the, you know, something like uh, the DACA recipients can can it's eight hundred thousand people, but it's a, created an enormous political movement. Or even in the last uh, election, seventy five thousand uh, people, mostly old economy voters, as as I point out, really swung the election. So, understanding that it's not just a broad brush that that explains society, but really these hundreds of small microtrends. And then if you read the book, I've picked out 50, but, but learn to do it yourself because it will help you, I think, in, in life and uh, in business. Another thing that you point out in the book is that we're at a time where we have seemingly unlimited choices. would love to have you talk to us a bit about how has this abundance of options surprisingly resulted in people actually making fewer choices. This one surprised me a little bit. Well, uh, I think this is the biggest change between, I wrote a book, Microtrends, 10 years ago, and when I look at how society changed today, it's, in Microtrends, it's, look, we're going to have a world of choice. You go into Starbucks, and there's 155 different varieties of something as simple as coffee. This is going to be incredible. So you fast forward 10 years, and people go into the Starbucks, and they say, oh, give me the regular. 
that the people have picked their choices. Or I say in the book, think of America as a restaurant that starts out serving chicken and fish. Not a lot of passion in chicken and fish. Then you add steak and sushi. And the steak eaters eat steak every day, and the sushi connoisseurs eat sushi every day. And so the fact that I've given you more choice actually results in your finding something you like so much, you choose it every day, so you ch- stop making choices. And then think of that in news, think of that in, in how you buy things. And what I thought would be a world where everybody would be experimenting all the time, uh, it, it can turn out to be quite the opposite. And then we get more divided and more niched. And, and I think I think we have to figure out how to mix it up a bit more. Next, I'd love to have you comment a bit about some of the things you observed about millennials who, you know, as a generation, it's an interesting time because they're beginning to find their stride in the workplace and in society. They're starting to move into positions of greater influence. What are some of the things you observe there? Well, I, I think one of the most important things that I think is underappreciated is that, that so many more millennials now went to you know, more education, went to college than ever before, almost two-thirds, at least start college. So I think we have to do a better job getting people through college. Uh, and that rather than get married in early age, marriage and childbearing got pushed back into late 20s, early 30s. So that means that that uh, these millennials are spending 10 or 15 years on their own, 10 or 15 years of no full responsibilities, so they're not paying property taxes typically. Uh, they, they Some of them work even harder, and others say, hey, I don't need that much money. And they live typically more with uh, roommates. They're, they've helped to revitalize some of the urban areas. Uh, it's not very good for religion in many ways because I, I think people get a lot more religious once they have their first and when, when they have and if they have their first child. It, it tends to be such a such a kind of changing uh, life experience that that really, uh, if that's delayed ten or fifteen years, I think there's a there's a sag in, in religion. So there's so many consequences, and, and even when they do get married, because they've spent so much time on their own, they're a lot more finicky than, than they ever were. Uh, and then even just one thing I'll slip in, too, is the interesting thing is that when they, they push back uh, having a child five years, they said, you know, I don't have a child, but I don't like coming home alone, so maybe I'll get a pet. And, and what I call SWP, or single with pet, has, has fueled some enormous growth uh, in, in the pet industry. Uh, and that pet does just great until the first child does come along, in which case, move over that, that pet needs a psychiatrist. Yes, the pet no longer has free reign of the house, unfortunately. <laughs> Talk to us about some of the things that have have emerged from our aging population. You, you use words in the book like gray power, and we're seeing kind of an opposite extreme who, you know, that group's kind of pushing back against some of the things that are emerging with the millennials. Talk about that opposite extreme? Well, a principle of the book is that for every trend, there's a counter trend. So we tend to look just as we looked at kind of what's happening with young adults. Then uh, we look at say, hey, what's happening on the, on the opposite end? Well, it turns out that politically, seniors really now have grown so that they're a group as large, if not larger than the millennials. Uh, and uh, they have reasserted their political power uh, in, in, the last, in, the, in the last election. Uh, I have a chapter on nanogenarians uh, that, uh, you know, the quadrupling of the number of people uh, over 90. It's two and a half million now. It's going to eight million. Uh, if you get to 65, you have a one, almost a one-third chance of making it to 90. The number of home health aides and other uh, medical uh, uh, advances and monitoring we're going to need is, is off through the roof. Uh, uh, I have a, a, a chapter on graying bachelors and, and cancer survivors. On the other hand, uh, cancer survivors, myself included, is a, a group we don't think about enough in terms of the, the damage and, and the experience that they've gone through and, and, and what it does to people. I mean, the good news is that there are 15 million of them more than ever. Uh, but I think in microtrends, you always have to be conscious of how uh, people change. And of course, the most fun is the graying bachelor one that... Uh, you know, if you're a guy uh, 65 and single, uh, you there's 100 single women for 62 guys. You've never had it so good, especially with Internet dating, and the seniors are a little more prosperous than they than they were in the past, and uh, they're living the life of Hans, uh, you know, much later on. So there's a pretty wide range in, in, in the book in terms of uh, 
in terms of trends over on the other side. Yeah, I was really blown away just by the diverse topics you cover throughout the book. It wasn't what I expected, and I mean that in a very positive way. Let's jump into a couple of the areas of the book that I found particularly fascinating. You had great chapter titles like Pro Proteiners. I especially like that just because I think that phenomenon is really interesting how the egg and chicken industry has just expanded like crazy. I mean, after all, like you say in the book, I thought we were all supposed to be vegetarians or vegans by now, yet this whole new business boom has emerged. So talk to us a bit about the pro-proteiners. Yeah, it it was a kind of a fascinating exploration because, look, you know, the government 30 years ago said carbohydrates, carbohydrates, it, it's better for you, better for your heart. And then it turned out that that was a colossal misjudgment on the part of the government. So then everybody said, oh, carbohydrates are bad. And so then I was like, well, okay, I, I know that. But, but what, was the, what became the protein of choice? What happened? Well, uh, you know, what happened was beef kind of leveled off. So beef was declining and, and it was saved. But chicken, it turns out, priced right, you know, text, you know, the acceptable protein, good enough for you, really soared. Uh, Americans used to have 20 pounds. Uh, a year, it's now up to 90 pounds of chicken a year, and and I think the same trends you're going to see in China and uh, and and elsewhere. Uh, you know, the Americans don't eat a lot of fish. It turns it, it turns out so that was not you know shrimp and salmon went up, but they're still negligible portions of the of the American diet. Uh, my my father, interestingly enough, was in the chicken business, so you know. He, it, it is interesting to see kind of a reaffirmation of chicken as, as, the, as the protein winner uh, in America. Next, let's talk about the no PCers. And this one really fascinates me because I, I was born in 1978. So, you know, computers were just starting to come into their own personal computers during my early years. And, you know, I've always had a, a desktop PC and then a laptop, although I'm a Mac guy now. It's so fascinating to see people transitioning away from actual computers to smartphones or tablets. And we're seeing different effects of that here in the States versus what is happening in developing countries abroad. So talk to us about this phenomenon of the no PCers. Yeah, I I think that that, uh, as we were all growing up, technology would progress that first you got a PC, you kind of understood how to work a PC, what was on a desktop, and then you got a phone. And then you were trying to translate kind of what you did on the PC to the phone and what you could do, and then phones got bigger. But but now, particularly in developed countries, uh, people don't get a PC first. They get a phone first. Their whole concept of technology is not the big screen, but the little screen. And, in fact, many of them are never going to get a PC, particularly as phones got, you know, the larger size screen, they don't, they don't need it anymore. Apple summed it up incredibly well. I had just written this chapter, and I turned on the TV, and there's a kid working on, a, on an iPad, and, and uh, I think the parent says something like, turn off your computer, and the, and the, and the kid says, what's a computer? Uh, and it, it, it summed up this whole notion that, 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 that when we look at the upcoming generations, they are in such a different environment and set of experiences with technology that, that it even starts fundamentally different. Of course, I was chief strategy officer at Microsoft for a number of years. This was not a great development. <laughs> oh, yeah, it is definitely interesting. And, and I make my living in the publishing industry. So, you know, as a guy who likes to still sell books, it's interesting to see the trends that are happening digitally, although ebooks have really leveled off. And interestingly enough, it seems that millennials really gravitate towards paper books right now. So I'm excited that they're a demographic that's coming into a place where they're stable enough that they're actually spending a lot more money. So so we'll see what happens. Well, that is, a, that is a great example of trend versus counter trend. I have the resurgence of flip phones in the book too, right? And, and as, as big as technology is, the counterweight to it, there's always a counter trend. I always say it's like, it's not Newton's law where it's opposite and equal, but anytime you're looking at, as you say, ebooks, well, now, oh, wow, a resurgence of paper books, too. Unexpected, but that is why our society is so hard to read. I really liked how you closed the book. You've got a chapter where you describe some ways that we could move forward. And I couldn't help but thinking of that line from the Spider Man film with great power comes great responsibility. So once readers get exposed to what you share in Microtrends Squared, what are some of the positive ways you'd like to see people move forward and 
put this information to use because I could see this being really powerful, whether whether you're a marketing guy or whether you're looking for ways to influence and change culture. You give us a lot of things to think about. So where do you want us to go? Well, you, you hit upon actually one of my favorite movie lines. So, uh, I, you know, really, I think there are a couple of ways to, to, to take this book. And this book, you know, is much more cautionary than the book I wrote 10 years ago because, because I said, well, look, uh, first, microtrends are, are probably more important than they were. So I want people to kind of become more adept at, at trying to pick them out and understand them because you can create a business. One of my favorite stories is somebody who uh, said, hey, I just read your chapter about sun haters where, where parents tell kids instead of going out and get some sun, they tell them go out and don't get some sun. And I, I retooled my whole clothing line So as a sun protective line. So so I think people learn something for their business. And I think the, the most powerful thing I find is people look for themselves in the book. And, and I would be surprised if there isn't a chapter that resonates with 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 uh, with almost every reader and say aha that's me and I, and I find that there's there, there's a lot of power in that and then you know I I also want people to think about like like what's happening with this uh, telescoping of choices with the niching of society I I, I have a lot of uh, red flags here raised about technology and particularly as we go uh, as we go to bots because you know bots or something like Alexa. Uh, the power of computers now to pose as people when they're not, and and not and people not really understand that, uh, you know, can be I think, um, you know, something that we have to figure out how to make, you know, clear. Uh, otherwise, we're going to run into some considerable danger. You cover uh, a lot of different diverse ground in the book, and I know for every author. I mean, I've interviewed several hundred authors. I work with authors day in and day out for my job. And I know that in the process of writing a book, we're often influenced and impacted by our research and what we pull together. So for you on the other side of this book, it's out in the marketplace. Is there anything that you have shifted in your own life or anything that you do differently as a result of what you put into this book? Uh, that's a, yeah, that, that's, that's a great question. I, I do. I, I, you know, on the investment side, I bought chicken stocks. Uh, on, the, on the technology side, I, I kind of have, again... Double down. It's interesting. I, I I make this point about uh, is it is it uh, is Alexa a he or she, right? And uh, uh, the answer is it's an it. And and, and so I think you got to be very very careful. I I asked the uh, Alexa that question, and Alexa came back and said, "I am in female character," which which is a slimy answer when you think about it. So I think I've doubled down. The caution about uh, about technology. I think driverless cars are a fantasy. Uh, I, I think people are discovering that that's a fantasy that's not going to be here for twenty or thirty years. So, so I, I do I do think about whether it's a simple investment or whether it's appreciation of what younger and older people are going through, or or whether or not it's it's understanding some of the dangers. I I, I actually I agree with you. I, I have internalized the kind of research in the book. Well, and speaking of driverless cars, just in the past couple of weeks, I think we had a pedestrian get hit by a driverless car. A driverless car got a ticket the other day for getting too close to a pedestrian in a crosswalk. So, yeah, I would agree that driverless cars have a ways to go yet. One last question here as we begin to wrap up, and you've alluded to this a little bit already, but I'll give you a chance to comment a bit more. When you look back on the publication of the original Microtrends book, what shifts in the past decade surprised you most? You know, on, on this side of it, and as you look back, what things weren't you expecting? Well, at, at that time, I was hugely optimistic that the world of choice, uh, the, the growth of what I call a Starbucks economy, uh, would make people fundamentally more unified and happy because now everybody could have what they want. Nobody had to be as unhappy. And, and that just turned out... Uh, not to be as rosy as I thought, because instead people niched themselves up. They're more very conservative. They're more very liberal. There are more people kind of, I think, in closed news environments uh, who don't really listen to, to the other side anymore. I, I, I did not expect the kind of division, I think, that, that this, this kind of technology would really end up bringing. And I think you're beginning to see 
uh, society itself to realize that. I think I think we're we're beginning to have a discussion on that, which I I do, you know, uh, you know the the book has fifty trends, but in the discussions before and after, I I do I do delve into this point uh, significantly because it really it, at the end of the day bothers me that. Uh, that we we have to understand that that the world is coming out differently than we than we had really planned. Yeah, I mean the one thing I think about a lot, I know how many people just in my own personal circles get all of their news pretty much exclusively from Facebook or one or two websites or apps and if you don't take the time to realize how much what you're seeing on those websites or in an app is shaped and curated, you don't know how much you're actually missing out on. Well, and, and I, I, in the end of the book, I talk about how the political system needs reform in terms of eliminating caucuses for primaries and, and how the news system has to be reformed, that platforms like Facebook can't really sort out to anyone's satisfaction what news should be at the top because it's, it's inherently an editorial judgment. And they were not set up to be editors. They were set up to be platforms uh, that, that people use, and and I think this has created a lot of problems now that have to be have to be fixed. Now, Mark, if people want to connect with you, if they want to find out more about your books, where's the best place for them to see you online? Uh, I would say go to markpen dot com. Uh, it, it, it's easier. Uh, certainly, uh, Amazon's featuring the book, and uh, you know, I, I I hope that they they will connect with me one way or the other. I'm I'm usually pretty accessible, frankly, and and will respond. Well, and like we do with every episode, I'll be sure to have detailed links in the show notes, places where you can connect with Mark on his website, social media, and a range of places where you can buy the book. So when you're done listening, just head on over to seantabbitt.com and we'll have that all linked up for you right there. It's time to bring this episode of the Sean Tabbitt Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with Mark Penn. Once again, our book today was Micro Trends Squared, The New Small Forces Driving the Big Disruptions Today. Again, if you want to connect with Mark and find out more about this book, be sure to head on over to his website, which you'll be able to find at markpen.com. And Mark, I just want to say thanks so much for sharing with us today. It's been a great pleasure and an honor to speak with you. Thank you very much.